My much better half is with us. She's in Florida um, with our little goddaughter, very excited, little Magdalena. So she gets to spend that grandmother time with, uh, and she's there somewhere. Steph, you're going to go on video? Maybe, maybe not. Well, anyways, let's begin as we always do in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Bobby and Katie, lay it on us. Lord Jesus Christ, together we proclaim that you are love itself. We acknowledge that your love holds us in existence. We proclaim that our marital relationship is the very fabric of your love. Today, again, we receive the powerful grace flowing from our sacramental marriage, flowing from your very heart while you were dying on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, together with confidence, we bring to you every struggle, difficulty, and challenge. We recognize in these your hand molding us for sainthood, the opportunity to sacrificially pour ourselves out for the good of one another, always without counting the cost, without reservation, that we might become like you. Lord Jesus Christ, together we recognize that our marriage and family is the primary target of Satan, adversary. In your name, we renounce all his lies and whispers that in any way has held or holds us captive that in any way has influence. Right now, in your holy name, the name of Jesus, through the powerful intercession of our blessed Mother Mary, who crushes his head, we break his chains definitively, completely. Lord Jesus Christ, together in this very moment, we humbly avail our souls anew to you. In this very moment, we pray that you flood us with an abundance of your holy presence that the authenticity of our faith will constantly shine through ready forgiveness, apology, and pursuit of your magnanimous love. Lord Jesus Christ, together we thank you for the amazing gift you give us in one another, in every way, the opportunity to attain holiness, to become what we are in you, to become saints. Today, again, we reclaim and declare our marital identity and mission to make you who are love known. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. So we are going deeper into the heart of the Trinity. And that is our very nature, our unsurpassed nature. And the enemy, of course, is such a simple insight from the very beginning. The enemy appeals, if you will, to a a counter nature, right? But our nature unsurpassed is the nature of God, Genesis 1.27. So the Trinity The T was truth, the fabric of it all. We know that it's under attack, right? We know that um, the big hinge on which much turns is whether or not we're going to presume truth is something we can determine instead of someone who determines us and then responds, Father Cromley, that second week, right? That there are things we need to be engaged in. We need to be agents. We need to be building the kingdom, but we can't do that if at the very core, we're not seeking God's grace. If we're not responding and allowing that grace to overflow us to all aspects of our lives. Last week, so let's see, T-R-I, incarnational, we had Melody Lyons, give beautiful testimony um, about her own background struggles and battles and really at death's door as a mother and experiencing and how refined and molded her that God um, really every part of our lives is a part of a custom designed retreat meant for ever deepening encounter with Christ. How awesome is that? Just blessed to be with you guys. And uh, thank you, Peter and Debbie for joining us. And we're all looking forward to hearing what the spirit says through you. So thank you. Deb and Peter Herbeck, if you don't know them, um, you've had your head in the sand. I'm kidding. I don't mean to insult you. They are some of the, uh, I think, most sincere, authentic disciples of Jesus Christ in the fullness of the faith. Um, Often, you know, we may find some who swing towards the direction of just the charismatic, right? Manifestation, signs and wonders, heartfelt. Then maybe some swing to another direction of just, you know, if you will, orthodoxy, perhaps without those streams of living water. To be in the fullness of the faith is to be anchored in orthodoxy, all that Christ intends to be Catholic, not educated. Tyville Catholic, but fullness of Catholic. And they have been wonderful big brother and sister to me. And I've been blessed um, in so many ways personally by them, but also through their books, through their um, conferences, their retreats. Uh, They are always ready to just give all that they can for the kingdom to come to live the fullness of God's glory. So we're going to just kick it in right now and uh, turn it over tonight. You can see my little screen here, just a little bit of a, you could find out more about them. Um, Debbie is the co-founder of Be Love Revolution, 
and uh, Peter Renewal Ministries. There's a long list of accolades that they've both accomplished, which you could find out online. But let's not uh, take any more time from the message that they have to give us. So, Peter and Debbie, so glad you're with us tonight. Uh, hello, brothers and sisters. Good to see you. Thanks. It's good to be here. Good to see you, Greg. You also. Yeah. Uh, Debbie, why don't you a little bit about our family? Yeah, just a little bit our family, since we're going to kind of dive into that, how um, the natural. Um, so I thought you were going to call us swingers when you talked about swinging to the right and to the left. And I thought we I are, can't dance. We, anyway. we are not swingers. Uh, but uh, we um, just a little bit about our own family. We have four um, wonderful children, young adult children, two boys and two girls. Three of the four are married now and having their own families. We have nine grandchildren between the ages of nine and four months and one more on the way. So we are very blessed to be continuing this legacy that the Lord has given us and um, and to speak to you a little bit tonight about how that has has um, been reflected in our own marriage and family life. Yeah, it's a really is an honor for us to be here tonight. And I was just listening, watching the video about our consecration to Our Lady and the the epic moment that we're living through, brothers and sisters, you know, like we're, we're talking about family. Debbie and I were married in 19, May of 1986. And I, you know, we already knew that there was a great battle on and, and the battle family was a part of it. Honestly, I don't think we ever imagined we'd be where we are right now, how dramatically the enemy has taken strides in un trying to undo the natural. You know what I mean? And and how fundamental it is just today. I think it was the the new Supreme Court justice hearing of uh just J Justice Jackson was asked by a senator, can you tell us what a woman is? And she said, uh, she thought for a while and she said, um, no, I can't. And uh, I'm not a biologist. I mean, that that is that is an absolutely breathtaking example of the, the level of spiritual battle that's coming directly at the family, directly at God's icon, directly at male, female directly at woman in particular, but not just woman. You know what I mean? I just think, I think that's a, that the, the enemy's going after that and the woman in particular in life. And so, so here we are friends, like God decided that we should be alive now, all of us, and that we should be married now and know him at this time when the thing that's most precious to us is getting blown up in the culture in a way that no one would ever have thought was possible. So this is epic battle, epic fight, and the Lord has all the grace for us. And we just want to share a few of our own thoughts from kind of what we've done as a family over these years since 1986 together. Um, the, you know, beginning with, and I know that, you know, Craig and Steph's ministry, the ministry you guys belong to are very conscious of the whole iconic reality of marriage. And so we're supposed to talk about the natural. And there's nothing more natural than what God himself established in the earth. You know, and God established two things, marriage and, the you know, family and the church. And the whole story from Genesis to Revelation is a story about family and marriage and all the rest of that. And so, like, built right into us in the order of things, and we've tried to kind of be conscious of it and appreciate it in throughout our married life, that the natural, the daily habits of life, the daily pattern of life is a place where we're really meant to meet the Lord. And express it instead of so we we're, we're involved in like full time ministry stuff. So sometimes we could even get a little bit, little bit like, hey, the actions out there, like the actions out there in the in the ministry in the mission, which is clearly part of it. But we would kind of lose you could lose sight at sometimes of how critical the daily habits of life living together in the natural husband and wife life is coming forward from two people weak and broken people who've come to know the love of god who are, are through god's grace and mercy are learning to love each other and in that loving communion comes eternal life comes a, a person you know an icon of a child of god and so uh we we tried hard to at times really work to appreciate the natural as a gift from god and then an offering to God, an offering to God in the sense of like, we want to live this with our heart. You know, we, we want to do this. So meals, very conscious of the importance of meals and uh, using, um, uh, how, how would I say it? You know, the, the idea of being able to show our children and live together that self-donating love 
is an image of God, and God's giving us grace to be able to live this with each other um, on a consistent basis. And uh, so, anyway, so we had lots of customs and lots of practical ways in which we did it that I wanted Debbie to be able to share some things on that might help to express the kind of theological or larger epic story that I was just putting my finger on. So we want to get down into the weeds. Debbie loves to live in the weeds. I She pulls me down every once in a while, like, get in the real world, Peter. You know what I mean? And so, and so she's very helpful with that. So we want to talk about some of the practical stuff we did to express that. Yeah, it's called complementarity. Yeah. Right? He's the idealist kind of floating up here. And I'm the realist that's kind of holding his his feet down to earth. And um it's, it's beautiful the way it works. And I think, you know, when you come into marriage and family life, it's easy to kind of, in theory, live in the abstract, you know, even as, as Catholics and serious Catholics, like we have this ideal of how we want to live. But once you start to live it, you realize that um, you have to really live in the reality of what's happening in your particular family and in the natural world while still holding in tension those ideals that you want to live by. And so we've learned a lot of things um, the hard way. Uh, we've learned by failing in some of the things, but I think the Lord has always helped us keep that ideal before us to keep striving. And really the ideal that shapes us is to help one another get to heaven and one day to live in unity with Trinity. I mean, that's, that's the goal is to kind of to make it home together and to bring as many people starting with those that he's given us into that reality. And so it's that ideal, that lofty ideal that shapes us, but um, it's really the, the everyday life that holds our feet to the ground that helps us kind of learn how to live it. So some of the practical things we did that were very kind of, how do we incarnate this reality of the icon of the Trinity? Um, some really practical things we did from early on were to really have customs of honor and respect within our home. And those are totally blown up in so many ways today. I mean, I do a lot of work with young people, junior high and high school. We go into the schools and I am just appalled by the lack of just common decency and respect that young people have toward adults, towards teachers, administrators, other adults. And so early on, we wanted to have that expressed, these, these customs of honor and respect um, to say that the people that you're relating to most within the home are actually bear the, the image and likeness of God. And we want to relate to one another as if we're somehow relating to God in you. And yeah. so um, we didn't, we had some early on, we had some challenges in terms of how we were relating to one another in our speech. And um God kind of brought us up short on that and said, you um, you can't talk to one another this way. I don't know if you want to. It was mostly about me to tell the truth. OK, let's get my sins right out there. Like early on in our marriage in the first year and a half, like times that I what I get frustrated or was upset about something or I got angry and uh, some would say something sometimes that were hurtful, you know, and I remember one morning, I, I thought, you know, Debbie and I had this argument one night, and I thought she was basically, you know, at fault. Okay, you know, I, like she's the one who, and so, uh, so I, how I responded to her, I thought was was okay. And the next morning, she went to bed. I went out for a walk. She went to bed. Next morning, I got up, had my prayer time, and Mr. Pius, I was praying, and and I felt like the Lord in a moment, a very vivid. I felt like He said, "You cannot talk to my daughter that way." And I'm like, what? You know, and, and I got out a note card and wrote it down. And he said, you cannot talk to my daughter that way. You can be angry, but you cannot sin. And you cannot wound her by your speech. So I'm expecting you to listen to me. And I want you to repent to her. And she was upstairs. And I was sitting there thinking like, no way, Lord, that was her fault last night. You know, like she should repent to me. You know, I was petty. I was young. I'm 63 now, but I, that's where I was. That was where I was at. And so went up and repented. And then Debbie and I sat down and we took out three by five cards and say, okay, how are we going to deal with when we, how are we going to have a healthy argument? And what are things we're never going to do in terms of how we speak to each other um, in those moments? And if we do, what are we going to do? What are we committed to do to repair them? Because we wanted to be able to de develop these patterns so that our kids would learn them by the way we're actually living them. And you say, well, why well, don't want to do it? Because I really do honor her. And I want to honor her the way the Lord loves her and honors her. And he expects me to do that. 
And I'm trying to teach my kids how to honor. We're trying to keep, teach our kids how to honor your mother and your father. And if I'm not doing it, there's no way they're going to, there's no way they're going to learn it themselves. And so, and then that, that led to moments where if I, you know, I failed in different ways where I had to repent to Debbie. And then I would tell the kids, you know, you know how dad just did this or said this, that was inappropriate. And that's why dad, that's why dad asked mom's forgiveness. And this is going to happen because we're going to fall and you're going to do that with each other, you guys, and the way you treat each other, but you need to learn how to forgive each other and to extend forgiveness and receive it, that kind of thing. So we worked, we did work hard at trying to make those things a reality. Why? Because we're made in the image and likeness of God. And not only God commands it, but this is the nature of our dignity and what is meant to be part of the culture of family life. And it's not so easy to do like forgiveness. You guys probably all can tell your own stories. Sometimes forgiveness and extending it uh, and wanting to be quick to forgive and extend it and repent is not so easy, but it's a critical piece of building a family culture that honors God in the whole way in which God wants us to live together and honor one another. Yeah. So I think our kids picked up the cues um, from the way we spoke to one another and there were just certain ways we didn't allow it. So that's kind of more on the negative side. On the positive side, we tried to really be cognizant of our speech being, you know, reflecting tender care and respect for one another, actually learning how to listen to one another um, and just expressing that we really care tenderly for one another. Even our kids, teaching our kids how to do that. They weren't allowed to like call each other names or say you're stupid or even say shut up. Just that was the Herbex, do not say shut up, you know, figure out a way, other another way to communicate that you'd like that person to stop talking. But we're not going to speak that way. And then we had some positive things we tried to do. Birthday celebrations. We always had time when the whole family would go around, no matter how old they were, and and honor the person whose birthday it was and said, you know, would say, this is what I love about you, or this is what I appreciate about you, or this is what I like about you. And, you know, for many years, it was like, I like that you make my lunch. I like that you do my laundry. But learning how to show honor and respect to one another and to their siblings was really a beautiful thing um, to be able to do that. So I think speech is a big way. Um, just um, trying to think if there were any other things, the way we celebrated you know, part, holidays. Yeah. Yeah. Part of the, part of the uh, honoring of birthdays and stuff was also teaching them to receive it. Mm -hmm. You know, like teaching them that's part of the custom just to say, just receive it. It's uncomfortable. That's okay. It can be uncomfortable. Maybe one child is like, yeah, keep it coming. Keep it coming. You're right. More of it. But for some of the kids, for some of the kids, it's just uncomfortable, but they lean how, need to learn how to give it and receive it, you know, and they need to be able to receive it so they can grow in strength from it and they can be, they can be loved. They can be respected and loved. So anyway, I think that was, that's how, I mean, even to this day, some of the older, my kids just feel a little uncomfortable, but they do it. You know what I mean? And we then we'd pray with we'd sing a song we'd pray over them on their birthday to bless them and to say this is what the kingdom of God's like this is what God our Father is like and this is why we're doing this stuff you know mm -hmm. so yeah and I think also just to give our children a sense of how we um, we celebrate things like um, holidays and feast days and I you know, I grew up in a Jewish home so the we celebrate the Jewish holidays as well and to talk about how. Um, what God, what's reflected in the natural, in the food, in the way we celebrate, in the way we fast, and then the way we feast, all the smells and the sounds and the textures of, of life around our table and in our home all reflect the supernatural. So not getting them, getting them out of their heads and really having them have a kind of an incarnational experience of all those things, I think was huge for them and really kind of brought together, I mean, to sit around our our table at Passover is just um, unbelievable to see our kids, even at a young age, begin to retell the story of the Passover and understand what Jesus did for them. You know, as we take the lamb and we take the matzah and we talk about what happened there, those are all ways that we're trying to kind of in the natural um, reflect what's happening in the supernatural. And, you know, we used to do uh, when uh, the kids were still living at home, for years, we did a thing called celebrating the Lord's Day. So on Saturday, like Saturday would be in the afternoon would be a chore time, you know, and we, we had our ways of helping everybody, you know, getting each of the children. Some Saturdays we were better at it than others. 
of everybody having a certain assignment responsibility to the house clean or to work outside in the yard. We get these chores done. And then we'd come in, everybody would shower up and we would get put our nice clothes on. And, you know, and then we'd bring friends over and Debbie would be cooking and we'd help and uh, cook a big meal. And every Saturday night we would have a meal that would set apart the Lord's Day that would start it. And we'd always bring family friends over. And it was a way of celebrating family life. It was a way of celebrating the custom to say, here's a custom that defines who we are. We didn't always talk about it that way. Like tonight, we're defining who we are, kids. It wasn't like that. It was just living it together. We'd sing, we'd celebrate, we'd read from God's word, we'd laugh and have a good time, we'd have a good meal, and and the meal would go long, it'd be a long meal, and the kids liked it, and their friends were with, and other families would join us. And then afterwards, everybody pitched in and cleaned up, and then we'd play games together. And then we'd say, first thing Sunday morning, say, hey, kids, we're going to, and sometimes, you know, we had to work at it because we're, we're, you know, human beings and we have weaknesses. We're, we're extremely excited. We are now at the high point of the week. We're going to mass. Like, we're going to go. And some days we'd argue and go to mass, just like your know, kids would be fighting in the back and we'd have to kind of pull it together or I'm groggy and cra- crabby myself and I need to kind of get my act together and, and just say, no, this is really valuable and this is what the Herbecks do, because this is not only natural for us as a family to give thanks to God, but now we're going to be with families of families. We're going to be with all these other families. And then really it's the, the Eucharist and mass was like a defining thing for us. It really was. It was, it was an important piece of shaping our identity. And then, I mean, Easter Vigil was like the best. I mean, with Christ the King, my parish is like off the charts with a four and a half hour Easter vigil every year. And from the time the kids were little, they loved it. And they thought it was cool because at our parish, you had to go to get a seat. You had to go 90 minutes early to wait outside before the doors even open because every, because it was so packed. And the kids knew it was special and it was a cool thing. And, and even now when they come home, sometimes they'll say, hey, let's go with their kids. They'll go, Let's go to the Easter vigil you know, together. Let's do the vigil instead of Sunday morning. So the reason I'm saying that and bringing it up was that was a lot of work. It was a lot of work because we'd have a meal. It was energy. It was a long night. You know, the kids were long beyond bedtime and all that, but it it doesn't always feel like supernatural, like amazing, but it's so good and so formative. And it was such family formative time in the core of who we are, which is the liturgy, which was great. We're so fan, we're so ha- happy about the opportunities we had, you know, mm-hmm. on all that. So yeah. and then I think too, as our children got older, you know, we really saw us forming the domestic church, but the idea that within the Trinity is the sending, the sending on mission, you know, um, and to, to begin to say together, what is the family, what is the Lord calling us as a family to do? How are we being sent out not only to um, help our children get to heaven, but to help others and to help our children engage in the mission. And so that was something that we talked a lot about, um, you know, evangelizing our children more deeply and then engaging them in the mission of the church yeah. in different ways. I mean, because you think about, OK, the family's the icon, of the Trinity. But guess what? The Trinity is, is also, in its essence, missional. The Trinitarian missions have saved the, have saved the world. You know, the Father's, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. The Father and the Son send the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is given to us in our baptism. So fa- a healthy Catholic family, you know, and in, in the natural is, is raised up in the supernatural to be a missional communion, a missionary communion. The family is a missionary communion. It's kind of a theological concept, but it's true. And so different ways as the kids grew up, we would engage in, you know, soup kitchens. We would bring in people that were kind of evangelizing to our kitchen table and help and conversations would happen. So the kids would get it as they got a little older. We made the effort. Let's get into Mexico on a mission, bring their friends. You know, Debbie would lead teams and, and they'd go down there, work in the garbage dumps and they'd pray with people. You know, we'd go down with uh, always trying to get as many you have people who are just about five or six or seven years older than them in the house because they think they're cool. You know what I mean? So like when they were junior high, having seniors in high school who we knew had faith, we'd invite them for dinner. We'd, we'd you know, get them on mission. And so they could help evangelize our kids. And we want to just kind of, without habits of doing that, it always feels like it can feel like the missional dimension of our life, which is fundamental 
is like an occasional add-on rather than something that's in our DNA. You know what I mean? And I know other families too, like we do this full time, but we know families that don't do this kind of work full time, doctors, carpenters, whatever. And they do that kind of stuff with their children and in an intentional integrated way. And that is honestly one of the most effective things we've ever done to help our kids get more deeply converted and to understand themselves as disciples. So that, that was a, that was a big part of it too. Just saying, this is the nature of what a family is, you know? So I was thinking about the Trinity, you know, the father, son, and Holy spirit in heaven. This isn't like deeply theological, but they didn't just, the father wasn't just like, Hey, we're pretty cozy up here together and we don't really need to pay attention to what's going on, you know, with all of humanity, like God actually sent his son into the world um, for us and um, sacrifice, allowed his son to be sacrificed. And so we want to have that same sacrificial nature to our family, which is we don't want to just be like a little cozy family that's doing their own thing. That's, you know, up on all the latest trends and technology and it has a lot of stuff. We really want to image what the Trinity is, which is really movement and missional in nature. And it's, I, it's beautiful to see like our children now, you know, really being hospitable in their own homes, having a spirit of sacrifice with their families. Like they got something, something we communicated, got yeah. and transmitted to them, really sunk in with them to say, it's not all about you. You know, yeah. there's a whole world out there that God is sending us into to really express his love. I mean, true confession. Um, I would say that the feminine genius and the, the woman's capacity to kind of create the home is critical for making the natural the place of encountering the supernatural. Cause I, I would, I had to grow. I mean, this is a weakness. I like, I would always want to agitate to go do more out there. And so if I had, if I was, you know, if we were taking our time, making a good meal and just letting it on, you know, making it, letting it unfold, let family happen, let the conversations happen and don't try to make every conversation an intense spiritual conversation, you know, or something like that. And I, I, you know, it, I would get frustrated. I would get frustrated, but it was because I wasn't even, I, I just had to grow in the awareness of the appreciation of the natural and how the natural communicates God's life. And so I, I had a hard time appreciating it at times because I was agitating for something bigger, better, go, 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 you know, and, and that's just not, that's not God's way. You know what I mean? There's a right time and a right place for those kinds of things. So anyway, I think one and Debbie was good at that. That's yeah. my point. Debbie was good at that. That's why I brought that up. Yeah. One last thought I want to just say is one thing I've learned over the years is that the highest value in all of this is love. It's not about being right, like who's right and who's wrong, who was right more and, you know, or who did more and who didn't. It's really love is is the highest value. And it's funny, I have written down here, Greg, my um, little quote is go home and love your family from Mother Teresa. So there you go. Holy Spirit moment there. But um, this is really the nature of the Trinity is this agape love um, to love beyond our own strength and our own capability um, and to express this unconditional love of other. Because in the end, when we stand before the Lord, that's it. You know, that's all that we have is love to show him. And so that's the, the thing that really it really is the school of love, you know, in the natural to help us elevate that to the supernatural. Well, so, yeah, I think our time's probably up. But, um, yeah, I was going to ask Debbie to say something about Mother Teresa, but we'll another, another time another we'll time. talk more yeah. about her. No, I saw lots of heads nodding, including my own. So thank you so much, Peter, mm -hmm. for wisdom and for sharing with us. Um, so much to be grateful for, so much to aspire to, so much to um, just embrace and go deeper in. So thank you so very much. Magdalena, thanks you too. Oh, how old is she? She's so tiny. One, one month. One oh, day. yeah. Bless you, is, is that Annie's daughter? Yes. Yes. Congratulations. It's beautiful. <laughs> thank you. Peter and Debbie, very grateful for you. Um, and I want to make a note for all here. You really gave us some great vision 
points of how we, we can make our homes places of ever deepening encounters, some rituals that are very valuable. And I think each of us, there are elements that we'll share now in our breakout groups. Welcome back, everybody. Um, as per usual, some announcements, our prayer, and then any questions you have, you are free to leave then once we're done with our prayer. Um, so T-R-I-N tonight, natural. Next week, we have Greg and Julia Alexander from the Alexander House, and their eye is on intentionality. Um, I do encourage you just to note um, that we really are kindred as one church on Friday, Eastern time. Some of you are from different parts of the country, but Eastern time, 12 p.m. is when the consecration is going to take place. It's worthwhile to check out online what your bishop is doing. Our bishop, for instance, Daniel Thomas, is welcoming people to the cathedral, Holy Rosary Cathedral at 12. I can ask his chief minion. We got two of the diocesan minions with us. I think that's correct. Right, Brett? Yes, uh, 10 to 15 minute consecration followed by Stations of the Cross. Excellent. So check that out. It'd be great to be united with you all in prayer. It's such a consequential moment in human history. Um, I do encourage you, Stephanie pointed this out, um, the interview Glenn Bax with John Henry Weston, I'll say it again. It's at around the one hour, 10 minutes, the last 20 minutes of the program where he outlines Fatima and uh, just gives a lot of encouragement to that. Um, our Deacon Ed Maher for our Belief in Beverages, it's our radio program this week, really does a good tour de force on private revelation, which is also very worth listening to at Ignite Radio Live. You can find that program and a lot of good questions at the end. You know, a lot of the, the um, real delight of it was the, the conversation that continued. All right. So let me just go here to that closing prayer and welcome our newly married Isaiah and Haley, if you guys would please lead us in this parental blessing prayer. And again, I make a note um, in the last week, 2000 of these things were distributed in churches all, all over the place. So keep that in your prayers and join with us on a daily basis in praying this prayer. So Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen. Let your holy anointing be upon each of our children, grandchildren and godchildren this day. In your sacred name, we claim for them. We renounce all whispers, lies, and influences of the enemy. We pray right now that each know your loving presence, be forged in virtue, and be flooded with an abundance of your Holy Spirit to live fully their identity and mission in you now and through all eternity. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. So grateful for all of you. This is the official sign off. This officially begins Afterglow. You are not rude for cutting out at any time. But um, I do would want to invite, we have, we're blessed to have Peter and Debbie Herbeck. If anybody's willing to say in your group conversation or, or share for yourself, what struck you the most in their talk? This is Kate Genovese. And um, I was very blessed by them just saying about being a family the traditions of birthdays, of the affirmation, and you think you're not doing it right, but you are. You're being Christ to your spouse, to your family, and just those little things plant those seeds of affirmation to your children and grandchildren that they are loved. And you'll look back and you'll think, I didn't do enough, it wasn't enough, but when you're praying and you keep God in that marriage and in that family, he will continue to bless us. Mm. Thank you. Thank it was you. a wonderful talk tonight. Thank you, Kate. This is Philip Kenny. Uh, Peter, uh, did you, like for your Saturday evening meals, did you do any form of like uh, liturgy or did you follow any form of uh, um, book or script or guide or did you just kind of create yeah. it yourself? We did. You know, we had, we had a, uh, up in the in Ann Arbor area here, there was a, a, a Jewish guy uh, who was became a believer in Jesus and he had a messianic synagogue, you know, of followers. And they created a, like a, a Lord's Day prayer, a Christian version of a Lord's Day prayer, Sabbath. the Sabbath prayer. I'm sorry. And so we would we would do we can't like can two candles. Debbie would light them, begin the prayer. And there were a few prayers that we read that helped. Promote. It just took a few minutes to do that, but we would we would do that, and so that was part of the ritual. But the the whole habits of 
getting ready and pitching in and sitting, you know, in the right places, just all kinds of fun stuff we did. That's, that was helpful. But yes, we did have a, a prayer. It was called our just Lord's day prayer. We called it, you know, so some nights we would back in the day, I played guitar a little bit. Sometimes we had guests, we would, we would sing, sing some songs together, you know, in the living room, like we other families would come and, um, and who felt comfortable with doing that, you know, or we would do a little Bible reading or something, but mostly it was that was that prayer. And then uh, just a very relaxed meal together and discussions and things. So as things, we got all the kids got older. We tried to have some at times organized discussions around topics. Sometimes that worked, but sometimes it was a bomb. And so you just have to, you just have to, <laughs> you just have to hang in there and relax. And sometimes I was probably a little too intense you know what I mean? So uh, you just, it's just let the natural happen. <laughs> You're on your own with that one. I've never been intense. Yeah. In yeah. My life. Greg, Greg has no way of relating to what I'm saying, but I'll have to bring him up to speed at some point. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes we, um, Peter would give a little like preaching before dinner and the kids would say, he'd say, do you have any questions? And they'd be like, say something like, can we eat now? Or are you done yet? Or that kind of thing. So said, what am I throwing pearls before <laughs> swine? What's going on here? <laughs> so we all have, young kids I think the oldest in anyone in a group is seven but a lot of like babies and two-year-olds and real yeah. small kids yeah. um are there any particular traditions that you're really glad you did from the very beginning or wish you had started earlier versus things that like maybe you didn't do till the kids got a little older or the family got a little bigger Mm -hmm. We always did family prayer uh, and it took on a lot of different forms, um, you know, the length and their ability to connect with it. Um, but it, we always did it. And when they were younger, we did it um, before the meal or right. Um, yeah. Earlier in the evening when they got older, like into junior high and high school, we did it at like nine o'clock at the end of the evening when they had done their homework and they could, we could all gather together in the living room. And that, that family prayer looked like, sometimes it looked like a Bible reading. Um, sometimes it looked like um, readings from the, the scriptures from the day. Sometimes it looked like praying the rosary or singing a worship song together, but I never regretted doing that and putting that first with our kids, even though they were squirrely sometimes. And, you know, I mean, even the dog would show up for night for night prayers. You know, you'd say it's time for night prayers and the dog would go trotting in, you know, so um, no regrets there. Um, I love that part. And our kids, our kids are doing something similar now with their own kids. Just great to see. I think too, we did one, one simple thing, which I'm sure you all did too. You know, be, when you put in the bed at night, we used to pray the Aaron, Aaron's prayer, you know, may the Lord bless you and keep you, you know, look into their eyes, say, look at dad or look at mom often more than dad, but we would do it. You know, may the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. Watch over and give you his peace. You know, I love you. And then give you a hug, you know? So when the boys got into junior high, in high school that didn't come as easy, you know, the, you know, the hugs and all that, but it worked, you know, overall. And <laughs> yeah, we really, per you just have to persevere even if it feels like it's not making a difference or there's no visible outcome. It just lended a kind of stability to each day and to each sense of we're, we're trying to turn our lives over to the Lord. So I think they really, I think they really did like it a lot. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think I think one of the customs that we talked about, you know, in terms of, uh, ex you know, repenting and extending and receiving forgiveness was actually being clear about being kind of being faithful to the simple steps to, in doing it. Like, say, OK, this is what we taught the kids to say, you know, um, you know, look at someone, say, can I talk to you for a minute? Look in their eyes, say, you know, I'd like to ask your forgiveness for the way I for punching you earlier today or something like that. And then um, and then it wasn't enough to say, I oh, don't no, 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 Don't worry about it. No, we did. No, don't do that. Let's receive it. Just say, I forgive you, you know, for hitting me. And it said, I don't want to do that again. You know what I mean? And then say, and then embrace or do something just to show. And so that was something we had to stay after. You know what I mean? Like keep doing that. Cause to say, all of us do that under the Lordship of Jesus, you know, he's requiring calling all of us to mom and dad have to do it too. But this is how we preserve one of the ways we preserve the health of our family and protect each other from bitterness and anger, um, unresolved issues, all that kind of stuff. So, 
it wasn't so easy to always kind of keep that as a as a habit, but we kept at it. I think I would I would uh, you know looking back, I'd say we did okay with it, but I think I could have done better at it in helping continue to do it. But important thing, yeah. I dropped the um, a link to the Lord's Day prayers from the sword of the spirit in the chat. If anyone wants to see that as an example, and I think Servant Press publishes it in a book too. Up, you're right. Thank you. That's great. Yeah. And if you are unfamiliar, I have to get my commercial in there for our Livid Gathering Guide, which is based upon Sunday readings. And uh, really, it's a mini hour family ritual. And to be mindful that anybody who's success in sports, business, academics, they have rituals and families. If we want to be successful, it's important to put that flag in the sand. And I might say in particular, certainly the rosary, certainly novenas, but are we making the time to meaningfully talk and pray, to listen from the heart, to be attuned to the soul of another? And, um, and Peter and Deb, I know you, you come from a community, uh, a Catholic community that fosters that. So I just want to kind of ask you the question, um, as you've seen many families navigate through the years and you've seen the little ones become young adults and leave the home, how important, two things, how important is it to have that relational atmosphere, not just moments, but a relational vision and a relational, I mean, with Christ, how important is that? And I want to even press you a little further and say, Neil Lozano, how important is it to maybe understand the power of parents to bless and to, to pray in very direct ways with, for, and over one another? Well, the relational aspect, there's nothing like it. And we, we drew a lot of lines in the sand along the way, like, no, you're not playing on that flag football team that meets every, you're only in what seventh grade. You're not playing on that flag football team that meets every single day of the week during the dinner hour. Family dinner is a sacred time when we're together. And so we really said we have to be together. Um, and we have to spend intentional time together as a family because that's what families do. And I think, it's getting a lot harder to do that because families, even within the home, are so isolated from one another through media and screens and all of that. And um, so we were very intentional even back then about not letting those things be um, put us in little cells. You know, the, the family computer, I don't know if you guys remember this, was in the living room or in the dining room where everybody could see it. You didn't have your own like screen in your room. You didn't have the ability in the same way to kind of isolate yourself even within your home. And so that's why we were so big on some of our family times being um, non-negotiable because it was it was the only way we had in, in many ways to keep keep everybody together and learning how to relate to one another. Even if you don't like each other, you're going to love each other, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. So. Thank you. Anybody mm -hmm. else? I think we could go for a long time and I'm very grateful for the time that you've given us. Um, do you mind just let's take, be blessed in conclusion by Peter, maybe as uh, head of the household, Deb united with you, lead us in a prayer right now, personally and in our marriages, and then we'll land it. In the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Father in heaven, we, we want to thank you uh, with all our hearts for your beautiful design, your creation. Uh, creating male, female, creating family, making us, and we, we want to live our lives in a way that receives the gift of what you yourself have created. We pray for each one of our families, each one of us. You know us, Lord. You know our brokenness, our weaknesses, our struggles, um, maybe in our marriages or struggles with children at certain times. Lord, we unite our hearts together and pray for each and every one of those situations and ask for your hand to be upon our children, upon our marriages. Uh, help us to not be afraid. Help us to lean into you and to open our hearts to the kind of help we need uh, where and whenever we need it. Lord, we ask your blessing on these families. Uh, use us in this hour to be courageous witnesses uh, to what you will and desire for your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. In the Father, Amen. Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Deeply grateful for you, Peter and Debbie. Thank you all again, folks. Look forward to seeing you next Wednesday, same time, same channel. And uh, hopefully to be united with you in prayer, wherever you're at, 12 p.m. Eastern time, wherever you're at, join us. God bless you all. Amen. God bless. Take See you, everybody. God bless you.